Hello, everybody. I am Marlissa Brigitte. I am the publisher of South Coast Almanac, and I'm happy to be here tonight to welcome you to our walking book club, which is not a walking book club right now, but um, it is part of our walking book club series reimagined for these times. So um, first of all, we just want to welcome everybody who's here tonight and who may be joining us later because this will be recorded and you can go back to it. Um, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties backstage, but hopefully they'll be resolved. I just thought I would start off by welcoming you. Um, for those of you who have been to some of our walking book clubs, you know that we usually take a book that is uh, associated with the South Coast, either the author or the setting. And um, we usually take a walk and talk about the book. And it's really just fun and quirky and neat. Um, so now that we can't really get together and walk as easily, um, we've been able to do this online. And you know, it doesn't have the same community that aspect that we like when we can get together in person and and walk, but it does have the ability to reach people no matter where they are. And so if you guys are out there in different places, tell us where you're watching from because it's always fun. I can see the comments. Um, and in addition to letting us know where you're watching it from, if you have any questions, you can throw them up there in the chat box. I will be monitoring that. And um, when we have our author and Corey in, I can um, put them up on the screen and share them. So um, yes, welcome to our first Walking Book Club of 2021, which features the book Paul Cuffey, His Purpose, Partners, and Properties. Um, I want to thank our sponsors for tonight's event, the New Bedford Whaling Museum and the um, Partners Village Store in Westport. Thank you so much for your support. They help to keep these events free and we're very grateful for them. Um, let's see, some other housekeeping events. I um, Things I, I put your questions up there in the, oh, people are responding. Rebecca is saying it's a different kind of community. Grateful to be with you from Atlanta, Georgia. Rebecca, I, well, we have some videos for you tonight, Rebecca, because after our last, um, online walking book club, Rebecca had reached out and said, I really wish I could have seen the South Coast because she spends her winters in Atlanta and she misses it when she's not here. So we do have some videos to show tonight. Um, let's see, Elizabeth, glad to join you from Providence. Oh, cool, a big admirer of coffee. Thanks for joining us, Elizabeth. We're glad to have you. And then Martha is um, oh, Martha's from New York City. Wow. We're, I wonder if, was it Paul Cuffey that you drew you to this or um, the South Coast? You can let us know. Okay. So I think we're getting, I think David Cole is here. I'm going to bring, hold on. I am getting the, um, David. Corey. There's Corey. Hey, Corey. Hello. <laughs> so we made it work, guys. Thanks for being patient with us as we figured out the technology. Um, and I'm going to, we did our little introductions about the Walking Book Club. I'm going to turn it over to Corey Neffer. Corey is our Walking Book Club guru, and she is a writer, editor, and just an all around, uh, you know, cultural maven. And so she is going to introduce our wonderful guest today. So if I mentioned everything, uh, should I bring him up now or should, do you want to wait? Yeah. We can, we can bring him up now. Let's bring him up just to make just, sure his I'm going to see some working. flattering things. So let's, 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 bring him let's up embarrass him. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, David. <laughs> Here I am. There he is. <laughs> Let me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> and I don't know if you heard, but we have people joining us from Providence, from New York City, from Georgia. Oh, so, some Paul Cuffey fans in South Coast. A Coke lot fans. of Paul Cuffey fans. Nobody <laughs> from Sierra Leone. Nobody, no. <laughs> Not this time around. All right. Um, David, I was just I, I was just going to introduce you a little bit. Um, okay. Googling you, uh, I went down a rabbit hole. Um, I initially was just going to talk about your bio that's uh, up on Amazon from your latest book. Um, 
then I went on Harvard's website and they had a little more detail. <laughs> um, David uh, has a, a Bachelor of Arts in Far Eastern Studies from Cornell. And then he's got a, a master's and PhD uh, from University of Michigan. Um, he was at Vanderbilt for a couple of years. And then from 1966 to 94 was at Harvard. Uh, David's written at least 13 books. Um, the, what really got me, I went on the comment section, you have nothing but five stars, um, with your latest book, um, Lucky Me, Engaging a World of Opportunities and Challenges. And, uh, someone I think named Vicki, um, in her review of your book, um, she mentioned some things that don't, I think, make it into more formal, um, uh, bios. She said that you never graduated from high school, um, that you traveled extensively by yourself and you did work in China for a year without having, um, really a plan, uh, at least nothing that was handed down from, uh, up above. Um, and you went on to complete your PhD in economics, uh, and then she says, uh, this book you've written, uh, not the book we're talking about tonight, um, uh, the book you wrote uh, that she was reviewing describes, she wrote, a life of wonder and accomplishment. Um, then she said, uh, your overseas experiences, especially in Korea, uh, you were instrumental in the establishment of the Korean Development Institute. You served as a roadmap for anyone undertaking foreign assignments, either in the private or public sector. Your Korean model has been used in Thailand and the Philippines and has influenced policy in Indonesia. Uh, and then she wrote, it was interesting to see how you guided Korean policy from the stabilization to one of development. And I couldn't think of what a more perfect person to write a book about Paul Cuffey. Um, it just felt so perfect. Um, so that's my introduction to you, David. Uh, but Melissa, we're going to also interrupt that a little bit and let that people process while we uh, yeah. hear from uh, one of our sponsors. Yeah. Yeah. So one of our sponsors, I'm going to share that my screen and um, one of our sponsors is the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And when I told them we had David Cole participating, they were thrilled um, in large part because he helped do their exhibit on Paul Cuffey. So anybody who's watching tonight, I you know, I would very much recommend that you go to the Whaling Museum and check out the exhibit. And also there is a park outside the Whaling Museum. Um, and hold on, I have to, I, I have to redo this, sorry. Um, that, that you should also visit. And um, I am a little technical difficulties today, sorry, just let me. Um, and so we have a, just a, we'll just start off with the first little glimpse of the South Coast, Rebecca, for you. All right. See. I, the I got it. Okay. Park. There we go. There we go. There. Well, let's start at the beginning. I'm on the the president of the. The New Bedford Whaling Museum. Welcome to the Captain Paul Coffee Park. At the New Bedford Whaling Museum, our mission is to ignite learning through explorations of art, history, science, and culture. Oh. There we go. And so now we just have a little bit of a glimpse into that park. And I just thought it was a nice way to start it. Um, and particularly since you were instrumental in the exhibit, did you also help? when you when they did the panels for these for the park oh yes <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again it wasn't i alone it was a community of mm -hmm. uh, descendants of paul cuffey and historians local historians and we all worked together with the people from the whaling museum and the basic the key person at the whaling museum was akia bernard who just is a fabulous person and did a great job of putting together not only these uh, plaques out in the park, but also a wonderful exhibit in the Whaling Museum about Paul Cuffey. And so I, when time's return, why I urge you all to go visit the Paul Cuffey 
exhibit and the Paul Cuffey Park. And, and also this, where it's located is right in the spot where he had a store, isn't that right? That's right. He had a, a store there with two of his sons-in-law, two freed slaves who came and went to work in his boatyard for a while and met two of Paul Cuffey's daughters and married them. And so uh, the two sons-in-law and Paul Cuffey had a, uh, a, a store right there on that spot, selling goods mainly from the West Indies. Uh, so yeah, that's that's Paul Cuffey territory there. <laughs> Very cool. It's not all in Westport. <laughs> and we are gonna put up in the comment section for those of you who, who um, wanna take a drive later and check out some of these sites, there's the paulcuffey.org which a, a group of individuals have put together. It's amazing. And there's the Paul Cuffey Heritage Trail. And I'll just stick that up there now. And Yeah, just mention it's C-U-F-F-E, only one E. Because if you do two E's, you get the Paul Cuffey School over in Providence. Uh, okay. So Cuffey with one E. Okay. And it's over there in the comment section. So you can just click on there and you'll get right to it. All right. Did you um, want to start, Corey? Or? Well, uh, I'm going to throw it right back at you because um, <laughs> this involves uh, some uh, South Coast Almanac Twitter activity. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we thought even that we were we were talking about questions that we wanted to ask you, and we didn't want to nerd out like full throttle right away. We wanted to kind of give a softball question, especially for folks who haven't read the book yet. And so um, we wanted to ask you, uh, who was Paul Cuffey? And Marlissa had this um, still fresh uh, experience on Twitter uh, about that same question. And uh, she herself trying to, in a succinct way, capture uh, in a tweet mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the complexity was. of this, this man. And right. Yeah, so I d we don't have very many followers on Twitter. It's not our main form of communication with our audience. We have um, mostly Facebook and Instagram is how we reach them. But, you know, I put things up on Twitter from time to time. And so in preparation for tonight, I was thinking, how do I describe him to people who don't know who he is? Um, and I put something up there and, you know, we we got retweets, we got likes, which we never get. Like I put things up there. It's like, it goes out to nothing. I don't even know if anyone sees it, but this one got a lot. And unfortunately I actually mistakenly deleted the tweet this morning when I was trying to retweet it myself. But, um, but what I wrote was um, that he, Captain Paul Cuffey has a remarkable story. He was a shipbuilder, captain, and venture capitalist who lived a swashbuckling life, evading pirates, meaning presidents come learn more about him and people loved that like that <laughs> he is such an amazing guy like he is that swashbuckling adventurer he and is. i and i just wondered when people ask you well who is paul cuffey how do you describe him uh, a swashbuckling <laughs> <laughs> explorer and imaginative thinker and you know, I was I was just thinking, <clears throat> uh, in preparation for this today, he lived only he lived from 1759 to 1817, so he lived for 58 years, and I'm now 92 years old, and so he, in two thirds of my lifetime, accomplished so much. Uh, when, you know, you couldn't fly across the Atlantic, you, you bounced across the Atlantic on a, a two month uh, voyage and you didn't, you didn't go down to Washington on an airplane. You took a, a stagecoach down there because the uh, Norfolk, and not the Norfolk, the Newport customs officials seized his boat and he wanted to get his cargo released and his boat. And they said no. And so he got hopped the stage and spent 16 hours traveling to Washington and went in through Quaker friends to meet James Madison. And uh, uh, being a good Quaker, why he didn't say, 
Mr. President. He said, James, I have been aggrieved by your <laughs> local officials. And so they took him seriously. And James Madison White's wife was a Quaker. And so he understood and didn't take offense that probably this first black man who was ever brought in through the front door or the side door, but not the back door, uh, was there to uh, plead with him to release his cargo that he'd brought back from Sierra Leone. And then the, the, the uh, Newport customs guys said, oh, you brought it from an enemy country. We were at war with Great Britain then. And so we're gonna seize your cargo. And he said, no way. <laughs> and so he took it in his own hands. It, you know, that takes a certain amount of guts, chutzpah, and just con conviction that you are in the right and trying to do the right thing. It's so guts, chutzpah, uh, the list is long of uh, a type of savvy that this man had. Yes. Um, your your book, Paul Coffey, His Purpose, uh, Partners and Properties. Um, I mean, it's it's very dense. Uh, it's. <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> um, wow, uh, it's. Um, you spent a lot of time uh, in this book, not able to get to a lot of those uh, those more complicated. Uh, aspects of what it means to be human and what it means to be a businessman um, because um, the situation with what we know about coffee is that your historians um, are still needing to do a lot of this groundwork, including uh, just verifying where his house was. Yep. Right. Right. Um, so uh, you, you might say, we were trying to address errors and omissions in the story of Paul Cuffey. There were certain things about which there were errors and we wanted to correct those. And there were certain things where there were serious omissions. And that's particularly true in the case of his father. You know, the father gets two sentences in short versions of his life. He gets two pages in the long versions. Well, we tried to really tell the story of his father and how incredible he was. So it, it's that was exploring that and his relationship with the Roaches over in New Bedford and with Michael Weiner uh, here in Westport. Uh, we, were, we were trying to fill in those so that the historians who write the bi longer biographies can get the story right because yeah. the bi biographies up till now have had quite a bit of that. Those on those particular areas, they've had it wrong. So we're, we're trying to deal with errors and omissions. <laughs> yeah. I, I could, I, I thought, Oh, David's being diplomatic <laughs> right here. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky to navigate, uh, um, I'm, I'm imagining just uh, that you, Betty, uh, you know, you've been creating a list of, oh, we need to address that, you know, like talk, if you could talk about the, how long it took you all to start generating this list before you finally went to the Taunton probate court. And, uh, you know, when you finally started doing the actual, like what were, if you could triage like some of your gripes, okay. some of the, yeah. All right. How, how we got started was uh, we'd read this wonderful biography by uh, Lamont Thomas. So he, he wrote in the 1980s two versions. They are pretty much the same thing, but about Paul Cuffey and excellent. And so I was intrigued by him. And then when I heard that Lee Blake was organizing a symposium held at the Whaling Museum of uh, I think 2008 or nine, uh, why I thought, gee, I'd be interested in getting involved in that. And the thing that really captured my interest was uh, his, his trip to Sierra Leone, his travels to Sierra Leone. 
what was it that he was trying to do? And why I was particularly interested is that when I was about the same age he was when he went to Africa, I went to Africa and I spent four years leading a project in the Sudan that was trying to do much the same thing that he was, trying to discover what the conditions were, what the issues were that made the people so impoverished, how they could be helped, how they could be trained to stand up and live on their own and be independent and self-governing. And I think that was just what was motivating him. He'd, he'd heard about the people, he knew there were people there, and they were, they were having a very difficult time. And so uh, people prevailed upon him, a successful black businessman, to go and look at what they were doing and help see if he couldn't come up with some ideas of how to improve their life. And that's what he did. And he, you know, he was up against huge odds. Uh, the uh, colonial powers, that was the era of the colonies when the British and the Dutch and the French and the Germans and everybody were out building colonies around the world. Uh, fortunately, the U.S. didn't play that game until the Spanish-American War. Uh, but uh, back in those days, why all those other countries had colonies and they were using Africa as just a source for the slave trade and delivering say, slaves down to the West Indies and bringing molasses up to Providence to make rum to go back and buy more slaves. Uh, and so he wanted to break that. And he didn't come from Providence, he came from Westport. And by God, he was gonna to try to make a difference. And he did. Your, your chapter, uh, which is, uh, it's heartbreaking. Um, the the special or the struggle for respect. Paul Coffey and his Nova Scotian friends in Sierra Leone. Um, that for me was a page turner and a jaw dropper. I couldn't believe how at just the odds. The um, how uh, England how Britain had uh, at times had virtuous aims and greed, uh, sometimes the banality of greed, uh, a naivete, um, it, uh, just time and time again, uh, all these failures over and over again. Um, it, the, the details that you got were incredible and I hadn't um, heard of them before. Yeah. Um, Most people hadn't, that hasn't been, Okay. Describe. So but that's, that's I, wrote, I wrote a book about my Sudan adventure with an anthropologist, and the title of it is Between a Swamp and a Hard Place. <laughs> yeah. To I give just... you a sense of in Africa and many parts, you're caught between a swamp and a hard place. And boy, it ain't easy to try and make something grow out of that. So here, here was one of my, my big questions I wanted to ask you, David. Um, okay. It's, it's not just one, but, uh, if, Oh yeah, you've got a five pages. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, I've, I've urged you to post those as a study guide for anybody wanting to read the book and to really get the most out of it because you've really plumbed the depths and it's, gone beyond that so well it's your book um it's your book well, it's not my fault um the i i was just wondering and this, this goes back to coffee being uh business savvy being savvy as a human uh having um understanding so much nuance in how to get things done um what is your gut instinct or, or what has your research uh, shown you concerning what you think he knew as he was embarking on this huge adventure? Was he totally in the dark on this? And my other follow-up question would be, um, if things had gone right, if, if he wasn't walking into a quagmire, do you think he could have succeeded? <laughs> I think he knew uh, quite a bit because he had read the book 
by the Englishman who took the first group of freed slaves from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone in the 1790s. And so he'd read all that book. He'd heard about the conditions there and people had told him about them and had urged him to go and look. So yes, he, he had some awareness, but he, I don't think he'd ever spent much time in Africa. Uh, he'd gone whaling around Africa, but not on shore much. And so he, he didn't know very fully what he was getting into. But the, you know, the conditions uh, trying to gain uh, self-respect and competence for the African population in the century of colonialism, uh, never going to succeed in the sense. And, it, and as I say, it wasn't until after World War II that finally uh, we, the African countries began to break loose from that, that stranglehold that the Western world had held them in. And, and you know, I went out there and spent three years with very capable people trying to answer similar questions on a very small scale, and we didn't succeed either. And uh, my co-author and the leading off of the book said, we write about a failure. Mm. This, our project failed. We had two grand hopes, not enough awareness of the real conditions and, uh, and all of the other obstacles, fighting, civil war, tribal grievances, everything else that were plaguing Africa and have for a long time. So he wasn't duped, he wasn't fooled. He just set out to try to do what he could and he did the very best he could. And it was incredible what he accomplished. Mm. Okay. Um, we are talking about a really dramatic aspect of Cuffey's life. Um, uh, something else uh, that, uh, for me, um, and the first time I heard this story, actually, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a movie crier anyway, but I, I teared up a little bit with um, Ruth Slocum's or Ruth Cuffey's um, uh, story about uh, Kofi being freed, and I was wondering uh, if you could just talk a little bit about this because this also I I find um, it it just feels like a maybe. A unicorn of a story like maybe there are no other uh we don't have records of other uh peoples who had been freed in this way or you know we know that the quakers were freeing um uh what you were uh what's referred to as you know they're black servants um but i don't think we have uh much records uh in this way well there's uh I'm just going to jump in for a minute for those who haven't read the book. Ruth is when you're talking about Cuffey, it yes. is um, Paul Cuffey's father, and Ruth is the granddaughter. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She is the. She was a niece of Paul Cuffey, and uh, but the uh, there are other stories, and one of the things that helped us helped me to get stimulated into setting up the Heritage Trail was there's a, an area out in the Berkshires uh, and it's dedicated to Mumbet, who was a freed slave. Mm. And she then became an important citizen in, in the area uh, down in the Southern part of the Berkshires in Massachusetts. Uh, I forget the name of the town right now, but uh, anyway, there are other stories, but the thing that is so unique about this is this is a, something written in 1851 by Ruth Cuffey about a story she was told that had to be in the 1790s uh, by a store owner in Russell's Mills in Dartmouth, and uh, 
he was telling her a story he'd heard uh, about a freeing of her grandfather back in 1745. So it's spanning from 1745 to 1851, the, this document tracing back. And we think that the story she tells describing how her father was, grandfather was so uh, in tears and emotional at being freed, uh, but he was 27, 28 years old. He'd been a slave for almost 20 years. Uh, he'd been treated pretty well, but it, he'd obviously shown great skill and intelligence. And so the people for whom he worked wanted to free him. But when he was freed, he was still frightened to how he would survive in the world. Uh, but fortunately, another slocum, we think it's uh, Holder Slocum, hired him and then set him out on Cuddyunk Island for 15 years tending sheep uh, with his family. Uh, but uh, so that's the story. There's a little confusion about whether it was Captain Hull who told the story or one of the Slocums, a uh, descendant of Holder Slocum who might have told the story. We think it probably was a descendant, uh, but it was in, Ho in uh, Captain Hull's store probably. And everything else in the, in the story is right on the nose in terms of its accuracy. And so I think it's just she got confused about who told her the story when she was eight years old and then writing about it when she was 60 years old. So she can be forgiven <laughs> <laughs> for a minor factual error like that. Well, and it, it, um, her story like anchors that, that paper. I, I just love it. And the diligence that you all, you know, you methodically plot along in picking things apart and figuring out who was who. And it, it just, it was the heart of uh, some really dense material. So I was, I just, I thought that was such a great moment in the book. Um, you also, uh, throughout the book, you give um, kind of this bird's eye view uh, every once in a while. I mean, it's, uh, there are these moments that you forget um, the significance of what you are uh, putting together, what you're building. And um, so one of those moments was on page 43. Uh, you said, the collaboration of a former slave, albeit some 25 years after gaining his freedom with a well-beloved neighbor and Mayflower descendant, descendant is worth noting. <laughs> and I was like, that's right. Oh my gosh. And I, so I wrote, how rare is this? Is that a dumb question? Uh, my suspicion is that it's an impossible question. And we yeah. know that this type of collaboration where you had Mayflower descendants working with former slaves, like that's, it didn't happen enough, right? Racism and white supremacy, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's still here. Um, but, yeah, it and, happened more with Quakers, I think, yes. than with others. And his neighbors were Quakers. And, uh, but they, these were two uh, farms up on Old County Road near the head of Westport. And uh, so uh, Jonathan Soule or James Soule had the farm right next to him. Edith Gifford had the property on the other side. And uh, so they, they were all living in there together. And then uh, Paul Cuffey, his son, had his boatyard down on the uh, Westport River, and he was in living in among the Tripps and the Davises and all of those old families uh, from Westport who've come down through the years. And they, you know, they respected him. And the, the richest businessman in New Bedford was William Roach. And there are two stories about how William Roach would not, was invited to Paul Cuffey's house for dinner uh, with some friends after coming to the Westport meeting. 
and he came and the table was set only for the guests. And Mr. William Roach is reputed to have said, I won't sit down until the host and hostess will join us. So, you know, he showed such respect. And his son, who was the same age as Paul Cuffey, uh, he gave the eulogy to Paul Cuffey when he died, when he was buried behind the Friends Meeting House in Westport. And he served as the executor of his will for the next 10 years. So you, you've got to really love somebody to yeah. be an executor for 10 years, dealing with all his children and all the issues that come up from handling a will in those times. So yeah. they, they, were, they were close. They were palpably close in a mixed society. And, and Paul Cuffey was half Indian, half black. Uh, and both the Native Americans and the and the African Americans were being harassed and suppressed in general in those times, but not all. And when they showed the kind of exceptional ability that his father showed and that he showed and that uh, his uh, brothers and sisters showed, they were all respected. And uh, but they didn't stand out. Uh, like a beacon in the sky, the way Paul Cuffey did. You, uh, especially toward the end of the book, um, you've given us maps uh, of a lot of the um, the land purchases along Drift Road that uh, Cuffey purchased from these um, these folks that I'm mentioning that uh, are descendants from uh, the Mayflower, who are also. Uh, who were very, very close with Cuffey. And it's uh, so many acres along Drift Road. And I'm wondering, Marlissa, if we can do that. Yeah, because segue I, into uh, our little video. And uh, David, yeah. so, so Marlissa and I got in the car one day and started at Westport Point and, and just let the camera go. So now is your chance, Rebecca, to see the South Coast from Atlanta. Um, <laughs> but one thing is, if you're watching this, you might want to enlarge the screen because I know it's a, this is the best I can do on my end. But if you take, if you go down to the lower right and sort of hit enlarge, you'll be able to see it better. But there, there we are at Westport Point, starting out. So we just had a, I, we sped up things enough uh, to not give you vertigo, um, and. <laughs> <laughs> knowing we don't have an hour to look everything at everything. Well, um, Paul Cuffey sailed by that point. Yes, in a tall ship. <laughs> that's tall what, ship. That's that's what what you kept would, Can you imagine a tall ship going by here? What people must have thought. And, I, and our house was here at that time. Our mm. house is just up the road. Oh, you can show us when we get there. We're gonna, yeah. Now we're in the car. You can okay. tell me when to stop All whenever right. you want. Okay. <laughs> it, turn left. Oh, you've gone by it. Oh. <laughs> you, we were on the left side, a little house. <laughs> I was I was uh, looking through. You had mentioned Isaac Corey's house is still. Yeah. We we must have passed it there as well. Yeah. Yes, you did. He was right next to us, just to the south of us. Wow. She's the fourth house up on the west side. We're the fifth house up. So now we're we're crossing eighty eight. Yeah. And so well, basically, the, these are all the um, you're coming. We're coming up to the properties that he had, and you can find all these addresses on the Paul Cuffey Heritage Trail, which is in again in the comments. Yeah. So these are private properties, so you right. can only stop at the end of the on the road and look down the lane. But right, you know it's there, <laughs> and you can genuflect as you go by or whatever you want to do. <laughs> and I want you to know we weren't driving this fast; we sped it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. So it's it's David. It was was it 144 acre, or I mean, am yep. I getting that mixed up with what? Kofi? Well, his his brother had over a hundred acres, but Paul Cuffey's property for his homestead was only four acres. Oh, there's the handy handy house. Yeah, yep, where the doctor lived. Doctor lived who helped take care of him when he was dying, just up the road a mile from where he lived. And, and then, uh, so this is we're now in Hicksbridge. Okay. Uh, passing the Handy Hill Creamery, 
Firehouse. And we're actually quite lucky that we couldn't have a walking book club because we never could have walked this because it was it's a six mile loop. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. <laughs> That's it a is. little bit too much for us. But there's there's the meeting house. Yeah. yeah. So the he, monument. He was largely built the meeting house. And we had a program on Chronicle a month ago about the meeting house and Paul Cuffey, the Chronicle oh. program up on Channel 5. Oh, cool. We'll try to get that link and put it up in the comments yeah. as well so that people can right. check that out. Here we go back to the graveyard. And here's Paul and Alice Cuffey's graves. Yeah, right very there. sweet. Yes. Right. Yeah. So. That's um, it. That's that's the walking book club tour, but it's a driving <laughs> tour. <laughs> I just wanted to give a couple of shout outs. Betty Slade is listening. So hello, Betty. She's also one of the authors of the book. Um, She's right behind me. Oh, 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 I could hear someone. This is an awkward. Wait, Betty. We're looking wave. at your hair, Betty. <laughs> well, we hi, love Betty. that you've done it. Um, Yes, and we, we uh, do have she, a few. We spent <laughs> hours together at the probate at the, uh, <laughs> at, over at uh, the Registry of Deeds, days searching on the deeds. So that, we did that was it one together. Of, one of my favorite questions of, that Corey has that maybe we can talk about now, just that how much fun you all had together doing this. Like you built your own sense of community. And what was that like? Did, you know, well, you were, were you friends before or did you become <laughs> friends through Paul Cuffey? No, there were only a couple of us who did on the deed search, but we did build a community of mm -hmm. people working on Paul Cuffey and uh, all yeah. devoted, all people we hadn't known before or hadn't known well, but we had 10 of us who collaborated on this and we still stay in close touch. And I think that uh, Paul Cuffey had a similar group of close friends in mm -hmm. New Bedford and Westport and Dartmouth uh, with whom he collaborated. But he also had others in Philadelphia, in Baltimore, <coughs> and in London and Liverpool. Uh, he had friends around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Very impressive. Yeah. So, all, uh, white, all white folk. <laughs> that is interesting so did he have i i know his he had well he had friends in philadelphia and elsewhere in new york who were people of color mm -hmm. but uh, the people in london and uh in washington were were the white leaders the officials mm -hmm. uh, in both cases so, so we do have a couple of questions for the audience and i want to make sure that we we um get to some of them. So Elizabeth asks, did he learn his whaling trade from Nantucket Quaker captains or from his mother's Wampanoag family? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, he started going out on whaling ships when he was 14, uh, the year after his father died. And he probably went out on Nantucket whaling ships and they were probably owned by uh, the roaches or other prosperous people of Nantucket, captained by people from Nantucket and crewed by other Wampanoag Indians from uh, Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard or Dartmouth. So uh, he, yes, he worked with both. And somebody, he learned navigation uh, who taught him navigation, we don't know, but probably one of the mates. He went on two whaling voyages when he was 14 and 16. And then he went on a third one when he was 17, and it was 1776, and the war had started, and they were captured, and he was put in a prison down in, in a Brooklyn boatyard for three months and then released. Uh, so he, he learned... Uh, to get to know people uh, the hard way. And it was probably with both uh, wealthy and, and poor people like himself. And Martha asks, he was incredibly successful by any standard. How much prejudice did he encounter from other whaling captains and ship owners? Uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot. 
uh, the, there's the one story that uh, he went up uh, on captain on a whaling ship up along the Atlantic coast and he encountered four other whaling ships there with white captain and crew. He had an all black crew. Uh, and when they first came in and asked to join the others in their whaling, why the others rejected him and wouldn't let him. And so they went about their business and he went about his and he proceeded to take five whales, uh, two or three of which he, he uh, uh, caught himself, harpooned himself. And after that, the, the white guy said, well, maybe we better join you. And so they, they brought him in. Uh, so he was, he ran into that prejudice on the sea. He would take ships down to the Carolinas uh, with all black crews. And initially they wouldn't let him come on shore, but all his papers were all right. And so after uh, they were there for a few days and behaved impeccably, why they let them come on shore and let them trade and so forth. And so he kept encountering prejudice and then uh, uh, just overcoming it by his own performance and uh, composure. And, and then there's a third story that he went into a tavern one night in, in uh, New Bedford uh, for refreshment, probably didn't, I don't think he drank, but anyway, he, uh, the owner of the tavern told him that uh, he couldn't have dinner in the dining room. He had to go into the back room and he said, oh, that's, that's all right. I'm having dinner with Mr. Roach. Uh, the richest man in town. So <laughs> I don't need to eat of your victuals here in the, in the tavern. So, you know, he had a, and another man tried to get him to give, he couldn't sit in the right, in the front seat on a stagecoach and a, a huffy puffy man came in and told him he had to move out back and he didn't move. And then two ladies came to get on the stagecoach and he got up and gave the ladies his seat and uh, moved to another seat. So he was a gentleman, but he had his sense of, of who he was and that he wasn't going to play these games or just cower to the kind of uh, racism that he encountered. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he, he had to be an incredible guy to be able to handle all that so well all around the Atlantic with mm -hmm. black people, with English people, with American people, mm -hmm. even with Southern presidents. <laughs> um, we also have some questions from Terry. She sent them in to us yesterday. And so just a, maybe just a couple of these before then okay. I'll go back to Corey who can finish us off. Um, we didn't really talk about the integrated school that he built. Um, she yep. wants to know how long was it in existence and what was schooling like at the time for whites and women? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, um, the we school. should, we should probably say Betty is the, one of the other authors of the yeah. book we're talking about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And she gave me something to comment on. <clears throat> the school was built somewhere on Drift Road, fairly near where Cuffey's homestead was. Uh, it was probably on a property owned by one of the souls. Uh, but he, he first tried to get his neighbors to gather together. There'd been a, a law passed in Massachusetts saying towns had to set up schools and Westport didn't do anything. And he tried to get collaboration with neighbors to do it and they wouldn't do it, whether it was prejudice or just tight uh, pocketed uh, guys who didn't want to put any money in it. Uh, we don't know, but he gave up trying with them after a while and she went ahead and built a building and uh, hired a teacher. And it was a school for 
his children, his relatives' children, neighbor children, white, black, Native American, male, female, all of them. Uh, and his daughters all learned to write. Uh, sons and daughters learned to write. Uh, so they probably started in that school. Then yeah. the second was, I guess that was on the school. Betty said we ought to say a little bit more about Michael Weiner, who was his his brother-in-law, and I think like a big brother to Paul Cuffey. He was 10 years older, and and he kind of married into the family at the same time that Paul Cuffey's two older brothers married out of the family. They married women and went elsewhere. <clears throat> and so this guy, Michael Weiner, shows up, Native American, knows his way around, uh, has a tanning business down at Brussels Mills, and married to Paul Cuffey's older sister. And they became intimate friends, partners, business partners. And uh, Paul, uh, Michael Weiner's, five of Michael Weiner's sons sailed on their jointly owned ships. And uh, I think uh, four of them were captains. And so they, they, that was a very important relationship. Great. Um, let's see. The, one other thing that Terry asked that I was curious about, what was the prevalence of slavery in Westport and Dartmouth during this time? You mentioned that the, the Quakers did, were not necessarily, um, did not necessarily own slaves, but in general, I mean, it was still... Well, there, there were no people owned slave, slaves in Westport and in Dartmouth. <clears throat> I think in most cases, they were like house servants. Uh, but they were black people. They may have been a mix of black and Native American, but and they lived uh, on the farms with the people. Uh, many of them, the Quakers didn't release them often until they died. In their will, they would have uh, that uh, so-and-so should be freed when I die. Well, often by that time, the slave was elderly, not well, and would have been kind of cast out into the world. And uh, a number of them ended up on the poor farm, uh, being cared for different places. So it, uh, th for them, it wasn't a harsh slavery. It was still a slavery that you didn't own your own self, but they were, I think, treated uh, reasonably well. They were fed, they were clothed, they were housed, uh, and they were uh, almost, uh, well, like permanent servants in a family. Uh, and But that was a very different story from over on the plantations in uh, Rhode Island, where there were many tobacco and other plantations, and the, many of the slaves there were plantation workers who did not get well treated, uh, and and Nantucket, uh, not uh, Rhode Island, Narragansett Bay, was the most active slave port in the in the country. More slave ships sailed out of uh, out of. Uh, uh, Providence and uh, Newport. Newport, thank you. I keep saying Norfolk, and that's not Norfolk, it's Newport. Providence and Newport and Bristol, uh, this, those were the slave captains of, the, of North America. And uh, they took their molasses from their distilleries uh, off to Africa to exchange it for slaves taken down to the the West Indies to, to work on plantations, pick up molasses to bring up here to make more rum. That was the triangle trade, and the, the headquarters of it was Narragansett Bay, outpacing any other port in North America. Mm -hmm. That's a heritage that, you know, Brown, the Brown brothers, one Brown was a slave master and slave ship owner. 
and the other Brown, Moses Brown, was a Quaker and against slavery. So uh, the, at least half the Brown brothers have to uh, owe us something more than just a university. Mm, yeah. <laughs> a damn good university. But. <laughs> yeah. So we have five minutes left. I want to make sure that we get people off in time to for their regularly scheduled evening. All right. <laughs> Corey, did you have anything else that you wanted to to ask? I, and and it, after that, then we'll just talk about our next scheduled book group, which is in May. Well, I wanted uh, reading about uh, land deeds, and uh, you know, you you used a lot of the language on the deeds that you found. So I was yeah. I wasn't reading old English, but lots of fence and pounds and sterling or shillings um and just kind of this this monotony of time and time again all of these different uh purchases that coffee was making and uh giving things over to family or friends or taking care of widows or friend uh, widows of friends um the because uh I feel I, I'm assuming this hasn't all been tabulated and, and put together in one place. Um, you were just exhaustive with uh, putting this all together. And as I was reading it, I felt that I was starting to, it, it was like this kind of vivifying Cuffy's life in a way. It was making it very um, palpable through reading all of this kind of boring quotidian monotonous stuff that he did but i found it it was almost like um uh a meditation i just loved it it was like kind of this centering thing i did um and so and then along the way you uh you do have little comments that you make that i found just uh just really good storytelling david and so it's another another reason um, to to read this, to inhale it, to make it a part of you, um, because uh, you know it's a building block of uh, the, you've you've touched and dazzled us with these other stories that are not in here. You know the wailing and uh, these uh, more dramatic tales he has of not being served or just. Uh, you know, visiting the presidents and things. And these, uh, the storytellers out there are are working on these stories now and have yet to start. And this is such a, another great uh, corner piece of, of this larger um, kind of resurrection and um, reminding us of what uh, an incredible person Paul Cuffey, Captain Paul Cuffey was. Could I just note that Spinner Publications that published this book is hoping in the fall to put out a new book by Lamont Thomas, which will be an updated, expanded uh, biography of Paul Cuffey, uh, which will make use with of some of the uh, correction of errors and omissions uh, from this book. And I'm, I'm sure will show up in footnotes uh, in the new uh, Lamont Thomas book. But if, to read the whole story, uh, I uh, uh, look for that in the fall, but this will help you get your feet wet and uh, use Corey's uh, cram notes uh, study guide uh, as you do. I think you guys ought to owe it to anybody to make it available to anybody who wants it. And we were trying to figure out before you got on, we tried to figure out how we would do that. And one thing is if anybody wants to see Corey has, like David said, she has about five pages of, of really great questions. And if you want and comments and, and comments, if you want those, you can email us at Marlissa at southcoastalmanac.com. And I'm happy to send it to you. And we will, um, if you are, um, if you're on the list, if you had signed up for this event, we will send it out with that email. If I'm able to to put a PDF with that, um, we'll send that out tomorrow. Um, and in general, just a little plug for that. If if you liked tonight's event and you'd like to know what we're doing in the future, just um, sign up for our email list and we'll keep you up to date on what's happening with the Walking Book Club. I'm putting that in the comment section right now. Um, and also the, the next book that we're choosing 
is ironically, we've never done a biography before tonight. And yet our next book is also a biography. So um, we are, it's in May and we're kind of excited because we're gonna bring back the walking portion of the walking book club. Um, but we don't know what May will look like. So we're doing kind of a fun two part event. It will be a hybrid. And um, on May 12th, we will be discussing our book with the author. The book um, is about Madam CJ Walker, who is, um, actually a lot of parallels with with Paul Cuffey in some ways. She was orphaned at 10 and started her working life as a washerwoman and ended it as America's first self-made female millionaire. Um, and she was also she was the daughter of enslaved people and you know just rose to tremendous heights. Um, we're thrilled because her great granddaughter wrote the biography which is called On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of CJ Madam CJ Walker. It was an 2001 New York Times notable book. And then last year in 2020, it was adapted into a Netflix series um, called Self Made, which starred Octavia Spencer. I've read the book and watched the Netflix series. I would very much recommend going to the book. The Netflix series takes a lot of liberties and is not as, um, you know, it's like TV. <laughs> it's not, there's a lot that's, that you're like, wait, that's not what I read. Um, anyway, so we'll have Alelia Bundles, the um, Madam CJ Walker's great granddaughter, discussing it with us on May 12th online. And then on May 16th, on what we hope to be a beautiful spring day in New Bedford, we're going to lead a walk around downtown New Bedford. And you may be asking, what does Madam CJ Walker have to do with New Bedford? And we figure that she celebrated black entrepreneurship and so will we. So we will go and visit a lot of the um, local black owned businesses. Um, and we'll even stop for a treat at the Baker in um, on Pleasant Street. And we hope to even stop at the home of Elizabeth Carter Brooks, who was a friend of Madam C.J. Walker's and um, Madam Walker stayed there when she visited New Bedford. So keep us in mind for May with a, an online slash walking book club. In and the meantime, they can stop by the Paul Cuffey. That's Stephen right. Paul Cuffey Park right yes. next to the Whaling Museum. Yeah. Maybe we'll start there. Maybe we'll start the walk there. It'll be a nice segue from this, from tonight. We can sort of. There you go. <laughs> and I also chime in Lee Heald. I just saw she uh, uh, wanted us to mention David's um, visit, uh, upcoming author event at the Mattapoise at Public Library. Yes. When is that, Lee? Can you put it into the comments section so that other folks can see it and um and and attended. Do you know? Well, David, do you remember the date for that? No. Okay. <laughs> it's so in we, my calendar. <laughs> throw that into the comment section. Um, one last plug for South Coast Almanac, which we're a quarterly magazine that celebrates the South Coast of um, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And if you want to support this and other programs like it, and just support local story telling about this wonderful region, um, subscribe to our magazine. You get four issues for um, $19.99. This is our current issue right now. And um, the next one comes out in March. And I will put that link in the in the um, comments as oh, well. So that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Lee hasn't put it in the the date yet, but just go, I think, probably to the Mattapoiset Library and look at their event schedule. Um, and I, I think David has so many stories in him that we should all, we should all show up then too. We should be at the Mattapoisett Library event as well. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank well, you so much. Thank you, David. We really appreciate your time. Well, and nice to meet you both. Yeah, and I loved the book. The book was so fun. It was, <laughs> it was like seeing what what history detectives do. You know. You know, when when I took it into Joe Thomas first, he said, "Well." Uh, not very exciting reading. <laughs> so Corey, Corey made it very exciting. Wait, Corey, show them your, put your book up and see how much writing there is in there. It's so, oh! like, like it is actually, there is so many exciting parts. And I find part of the excitement is just seeing how you guys went about your business of finding out the, the truth. You know, it was like a detective's show. It is. It is. It is. So it has been. <laughs>
All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye.